The last speaker for this session is Carrie Lampwood. She is at uh, UCSB, where she is a postdoctoral researcher. She also completed her doctorate there. Welcome, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Wow, I really enjoyed that previous talk, but now I have to collect myself and give my own talk, and there was a lot of overlap in terminology. My brain is scrambled. I apologize in advance. I'm going to try to go slow and uh, keep it very clear. So I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, and thank you all for being here. Um, I look forward to uh, watching everyone's talks during the rest of the workshop. I am a postdoc who uh, sits with one butt cheek in computer science and the other in physics. And what I'll be talking about today is one of the projects that I'm involved uh, with in computer science. But I'm a relative newcomer to this project, so the credit for all the work I'll be talking about today goes to Dan Nermy, John Brevik, and Rich Walski, as well as the credit for most of the slides. And I take full responsibility for um, What's that? I apologize. Is this on? Great. Okay. Uh, and I take full responsibility for any uh, errors in the presentation. Those are all mine. Um, so I'll be talking about a non-parametric statistical technique that's been used in a very uh, particular context. And my interest is in the technique more generally. I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end of the talk. But as I said, I'll be going through the talk talking about a very specific example in which the technique, or strategy rather, because it's a particular technique plus a couple add-ons has been used. So um, the domain I'll be talking about is high performance computer science systems, uh, and specifically batch queued supercomputers. So I wanted to know, um, who all here has submitted a batch job to a supercomputer in an HPC time? Okay, fantastic. So a lot, of, a lot of you are familiar with the domain I'm talking about, at least from the point of view of being users. So um, high performance computing centers employ space sharing, right? And what that means is that, uh, depending on how you look at it, those machines are either under provisioned or oversubscribed, right? So there's contention for those resources by the users. And those resources are managed using batch queue schedulers. What that means is that you write a little script um, that describes what it is you want to do and what kind of resources you require. Typically, you specify those resources by, by um, doing the number of nodes and the maximum wall time that you expect your, um, your job to run for. When you submit that job to the batch scheduler, you typically experience delay. So what that means is that that job doesn't typically start executing instantaneously. And so the, del the delay is defined as the time between the moment the job arrived at the batch scheduler, the, um, the difference between that time and the time it actually starts executing on a CPU somewhere. Uh, and for the purposes of this talk, we don't actually care about whether after the job starts executing, whether it finishes in the amount of time allotted or fails or whatever. We just care about what is the delay that it experiences when it arrives at the batch schedule. So you might think that that delay would be amenable to kind of mechanistic modeling because we have some insight into what goes on in the batch queue software. But actually, there are a lot of policy differences. Obviously, there are multiple of these types of software. Um, but even if we were just talking about one piece of software, there are policy-imposed differences. There are priority schemes and different schedulers, or rather, different installations, possibly even of the same scheduler, make different kinds of attempts to maximize utilization. And uh, if you're highly attuned to this field, you'll realize that what I'm talking about is things like backfilling. So as a result, not only will you experience delay, you'll experience highly variable job delay when you hit a batch queue. According to our measurements, this delay can be a significant portion of your overall job turnaround time. And so this is perceived as a big loss of productivity 
by the end users of the HPC centers. However, users often have access to multiple systems. So very naturally, the question arises, to which key should I submit in order to reduce the overall job turnaround time, right? Because what I care about is, when am I going to get the results? Or, if I have a deadline, where can I submit in order to meet the deadline? Um, so I just wanted to put this up. These are some um, measurements we took in January 2008 on one of the supercomputers that we monitor, and you can see that the Q delay spans several orders of magnitude. And that the, the data looks pretty interesting, and I'm going to be talking a lot more about that. But I just wanted to kind of illustrate the degree of variability. So how might you go about um, characterizing this? So you might think that using something like the mean might be useful, but if you have a distribution of jobs that looks like this, 95% of them wait set 10 seconds, right, and then you have one each at the orders of magnitude higher than that, then you end up with a mean wait time that's not actually terribly representative of anything. Um, instead, if you look at the 0.95 quantile, so the 95th percentile, you're going to come up with an answer that intuitively tells you something like there's a 95% chance that a job will wait 10 seconds or less. That's pretty useful. So in general, it turns out that in a situation like this, it could be very useful to be able to predict an upper bound on how long the next job will wait in the queue. So I'm going to get a little bit tutorial, and that's largely because I don't know the audience, and I suspect the audience is very diverse. I apologize if this is uh, too simple <laughs> for most of you. So I just wanted to define kind of the notion of quantiles and confidence that the next couple of slides are going to be based on. So the Q of quantile is just a value that Q of the data will be less than or equal to. Right? And some quantiles are very familiar. So the median is the half quantile. And the 0.95 quantile, or 95th percentile, is the value that 95% of the data is less than or equal to. And then, for example, the third quartile is the value that 75%, or three quarters of the data, is less than or equal to. And so the property of this that I'm going to use in the next slide is that just a randomly chosen sample of the data has probability Q of being less than or equal to the Q of quantum. Um, I'll also be talking about the upper confidence level C, so half of a confidence interval, right? The upper half. Um, so what I mean by the upper confidence level C is that if I estimate something and then I, I um, do a measurement of it over and over x times, I expect the true value, so the, the measured value, to be less than or equal to my x estimate c times x over time. So if I use as my upper confidence level 0.95, then my measurements should be less than or equal to my estimate 95% of the times that I take those measurements. OK, so what kind of queries can we make that are quantile based uh, regarding this batch key wait time? So the first is, what's the maximum wait time my job will experience with probability p? As you might imagine, that's a pretty useful thing to know. The other is, with what probability will my job start before time d? Yeah. The observation here is that while batch Q delay times are highly variable, D and P predictions are actually relatively stable. And so as we make these predictions online and more and more data comes in, they don't flop around wildly. They're, they're fairly stable. So how do we do this? OK. Um, so this is a picture of a CDF of the measurements. Uh, so just historical data that's been gathered and added up in a CDF. When we ask, what's the maximum wait time my job will experience with probability P, right? That was the uh, Q bound 
query of the previous slide, then what we're doing is we're choosing the probability, right? Hitting, hitting the data and then going down to get a time. When we do the other kind of query, the um, Q delay, no, Q deadline, um, query, what we say is, if I need my job to start by blah, we we'll pick a time, what are the odds? We go up and get a probability. So this is going to be our methodology, sort of in broad strokes. Um, so how do we find the quantile of interest? The quantile of interest is is the, the datum that sits at a particular index, right, in a, in a sorted list of data. So how do we find that index is really what I'm asking. Um, the methodology we use is a non-parametric method developed by John Brevik called the binomial method. And the binomial method takes three inputs, the quantile of interest, the upper confidence level C, and the number of observations N. And so the, the, the way you kind of think about this is as follows. You treat all your observations as Bernoulli trials, right? So success failure trials. And you declare a success if an observation is greater than or equal to the peak <coughs> quantile. Um, so the probability for that is this, it's 1 minus q. So here, this binomial coefficient gives you the probability that exactly j trials will be um, successes. And so the sum, then, is the probability that k or fewer observations will be successes. So what we're looking for is walking from 0 up to n in k, we want to find the lowest k that results in this probability exceeding the specified confidence level. <clears throat> this will give us the index into a list in descending order for the qth quantile with upper level c confidence. So now we have a way, right, to find our desired quantile with our desired confidence level in a descending list. And it's possible to do this in ascending or descending order, and it turns out you can do uh, lower bounds and other things like that as well. But uh, the, the problem that I'm talking about today uses this. Okay. So how do you verify that this works? Um, first, first of all, you need another predictor to compare it to. So before this work, uh, parametric predictors were assessed. And I'm going to be comparing the results of the binomial method to the best parametric predict predictor. The metrics you're looking for are correctness. So do you get the right upper bound predictions for the expected percentage of jobs? And then accuracy, because you want to have as conservative a bound I'm sorry, as, um, as tight a bound, I guess is what I'm trying to say, as possible. And so we have um, time series, and we use them in a trace-based simulation in which they're all used. So this is the evaluation. These are all the kind of time series we have. And you can see that in all but a couple of cases, we achieve the 0.95 desired um, confidence here. The uh, best parametric predictor was a log uniform predictor, and you can see that it succeeds almost as much, but it overpredicts in some cases. And so the way to think about that overprediction is to uh, think of the ratio of the overprediction in one method versus the other and the log uniform overpredicts more than we do. So the binomial method gives you a tighter bound there. But like many statistical techniques, uh, this, the binomial method, is meant to be applied to independent identically distributed data, which 
as you can see, this is probably not. So there, there are features both <coughs> along the x-axis and along the y-axis. Intuitively, the features in this direction have to do with the fact that jobs that last longer or request a higher number of resources are harder to schedule. And so they sit in the queue for a longer time. And then the features along this axis have to do with the fact that the state of the machine changes, but the batch, the batch scheduler continues to operate as if nothing had happened. So parts of the machine can go up. Other parts can be um, used for reservations. And the, the state of the queue can reflect that. And so the delays reflect that, even though it's not explicitly stated anywhere. So the non-IID problems of multimodality, so that's along this axis, and non-stationarity along the x-axis, um, can be addressed by applying two kinds of data filters. One is a clustering filter, and one is a change point detection. And they're described in great detail in this paper, so I'm just going to um, hit them here for a second. So in clustering, the, what we're trying to do is take these two attributes of the job, the requested nodes and the maximum execution time, or their product, right, which is the expected CPU time, and from this, guess what the queue wait time is going to be like. And so you can't use simple clustering to do that, to go from these variables to this variable. But you can use model-based clustering to do that. So we use these two attributes, which we know a priori, before we know the actual wait time, to guess what kind of wait time we're going to experience. And then we stick the job in the cluster according to that. And the details are in the paper. Uh, with change point detection, what we're trying to do is separate these phases out. Uh, basically, phases on the machine is like this, which is like this, which is like this. And the way that works is we calculate the autocorrelation in the data history. We um, figure out, so this has to be done empirically. We, we go back and generate synthetic data and empirically de determine the number of consecutive failures that would be unlikely, right? And then we use the binomial method to detect failures. If we have more than, let's say, for the 0.95 quantile, three failures consecutively, then we know that a change point has occurred, so we trim the history and start our, our history all over again. So we assume we're in a completely different phase of stationarity. So uh, these three strategies, in other words, the clustering, the change point detection, and the binomial method have been combined into um, a software product called QBET, which has been monitoring batch queue wait times um, all over the country and in a couple places outside the US as well. And at peak, it monitored about, about 30 HPC sides it's been integrated into many projects. And so aside from its primary impact on the users themselves, what's important is that it enables the building of management systems that use such probabilistic services to make intelligent decisions about where to submit jobs, especially if one user has access to multiple resources at a time. So Qubits is, is fantastic. Now, I'm interested in, in this strategy. So I'm interested in both the binomial method and the qubit strategy of applying filters to address uh, non-IID-ness in data so that you can then use the binomial method from a conceptual standpoint, but also in terms of how you write generic software for something like that. Do you do it as software as a service or as a library? Can you do that? And then I'm kind of interested in almost a linguistic problem of what kind of questions can you translate into this format? And then I also work on a couple other projects that I'm going to plug because I suspect that there's a lot of interest in this crowd and you guys can grab me and try to talk to me about this stuff. So I collaborate with the uh, LCOGT Robotic Telescope Network on building their multi-telescope scheduler, this uh, fascinating project. 
And I'm also interested in you know, provenance problems in scientific computing, and especially in what cloud computing can bring to the table when it comes to these problems. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And please come talk to me, live collaborate over the week. Uh, thanks. So let me see if I can maybe break it down and on the way answer your question. So the binomial method for a given uh, quantile and a given upper confidence level um, and a given number of data is something you can pre-compute, right? So you could, in principle, hash that or cache it somehow or whatever you want to do with it, except that if you allow users or software agents to specify those parameters, then you have potentially a very large number of such parameters that they might want because not everyone wants 0.95 with 0.95 and has a thousand pieces of data, right? But the bigger challenge, I think, is figuring out what filters to apply so that you end up with subsets of the data such that this method is applicable. Does that make sense? So, so yeah, and, and the clustering and change point methodologies that I brought up are not contributions as such because obviously we didn't come up with model-based clustering. But I think the, the overall strategy of trying to combine such filters with a non-parametric method like this is, is the novel thing, as I understand it at least. Right. So the stationarity comes in uh, where the change point detection is concerned. The change point detection is specifically attempting to stop the prediction when we detect non-stationarity and start collecting data again, such that you have, uh, I think we need 60 data points before we can make a prediction, right, that you believe is within a region of stationary. Because otherwise, you, you get some results if you use non-stationary data. It's just you're mixing in all sorts of things. Right? So change point prediction is what addresses non-stationary. Okay, I guess you have no seasonality no, I, the factors are much, um, much uh, tighter um, than seasonal. Yeah, just to clarify the attribution of the binary effect, what does that amount to improve? Oh, I yeah, apologize. It's, it's a very old way to find confidence limits for percentiles, but it does, as you say, require an item sample. So, in all the years, having to focus on it is the random so that it can be able to find Thank you for that. I apologize. <coughs> I'm just going to ask you, uh, in, uh, in the talk about the uh, orders of magnitude and how long it takes to do jobs complete, that um, sort of got this as a user, it's a very cool, um, just not frustrating. I'm sort of going to talk. So, uh, how, how does this technique sort of uh, relieve some of that? Right. Um, so, this technique is capable of giving you an estimate of one of the two types that I talked about. Um, of how long it will take before your job is scheduled, or with what probability your, your job will be scheduled, scheduled by a particular time, depending on how 
more friends or cluster. So I can choose like a different cluster. <coughs> Correct. Yes, exactly. Uh, you can also do two other things. So there are two types of um, uh, decision making type algorithms that are enabled by this technique. One is a virtual advanced reservation. So advanced reservations are, are something that most batch queuing uh, systems are capable of doing, but that is disabled from because it's, a, it's an administrative, administrative headache. And so having a statistical technique like this allows you to virtually do that. And that's saying, hey, I'm going to want this many nodes for this much time at that time. Okay, can you, with 95% uh, probability, give me that? And so you, you make the thing wait the appropriate time, and it checks the probabilities, and then it goes ahead and submits your job at the point when it thinks it will start by the time you want it to start. And then you can also do um, co-allocation, which is another thing that's administratively disabled in a lot of places, although I suspect that as XC um, moves forward, more and more things like this will be enabled, and that's if you want an allocation in two places at once, then you can get that statistically. All right, let's thank Terry again.